<coughs> well, good morning and welcome to Zen Live, or a new metaphor for your toolbox. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be back. I was uh, went up to uh, D.C. to Washington to uh, see my daughter in uh, uh, playing on the Kennedy Center in uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, where she's been an understudy for the last over the last year or so. And um, anyway, I'm glad to be back. Uh, it's interesting that when you, and I know we all have this, this experience, at least I do, is when you go away for a weekend, two days seems, and, uh, and you come back and there's a sense that you've, uh, um, it's hard to, just, for me it's hard to describe, it's like there's a, uh, a hole or a timeless, but you've been somewhere else but time has been broken up, and by time I mean your everyday routine. I have a very mundane, uh, retired life here, semi-retired, and I get up early, I do my Facebook, uh, I write, I have lunch, I take a nap, I uh, watch a British mystery, I have a martini and do another Facebook, and then I write some more, and then I watch recordings of the uh, Stephen Colbert from the previous night, uh, and then I go to bed, and that's about it. <laughs> so suddenly there's this space opens up, and now I'm in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'm out having drinks along the Potomac River and having all these interesting conversations and seeing a play and all this, you know, and then uh, the drive back, and boom, I'm back in my steady, consistent, persistent world, you know, and it just uh, has this feeling of, um, of uh, a different time, um, an opening, uh, you know, and so uh, anyway, I'm back, and uh, let's take a look at Tolley's quote for today. So as you remember, we take these quotes and we pull them apart like a cotton ball uh, to get some wisdom out of it, and the quote for today is small but very powerful, and uh, it goes, Non-reaction to the ego in others is one of the most effective ways not only of going beyond ego in yourself, but also dissolving the collective human ego. The collective human ego. So I got to, you know, I, I begin to pull that apart today, and uh, because what he's saying is that humanity has an ego, but then that breaks down, you see, uh, into uh, just, just like humanity breaks down into societies or cultures, and the cultures break down into localities, and the localities break down into uh, uh, small regions, and then the regions break down into family units, and then the family units break down into your family, and then that breaks down into relationships in the family because each one is a little different world. And then those break down into you. And then your ego then breaks down into various uh, uh, attitudes and various uh, uh, layers of your own psyche, you see. And so it's kind of like Russian nesting dolls. So I thought we would take a look today at the uh, collective ego of our uh, own society here and just uh, get a little metaphor that helps us get a grip of it. Now, before we go any further, uh, this word ego gets jumped around. It becomes the devil. It becomes something I can fix. It becomes something I don't have. I don't have an ego. Uh, you got one. I don't got one. Uh, or I can fix it or I can get rid of it or I can't get rid of it or uh, it exists or it doesn't exist. Uh, the world exists or the world doesn't exist, on and on and on. It's very confusing, very confusing. So let's just look at the ego as a point of view. As if you were on the Appalachian Trail and you have these outlooks and every time you stop at an outlook you have a different view of the of the mountains. And then and you see it, you, you actually see 
a panorama, you know, and then you go a few a mile and you stop at another view and you see another panorama. And then you go a lo- another mile <coughs> and you see another view and they see another panorama. Each one is a separate view, a, a separate object. We assume, however, that that Appalachian reality out there exists separate from our views. We don't see, in our culture, the materialistic culture, we don't see that I'm creating the view, that I'm participating in the creation of the view. We assume that there is one view out there, and my view is seeing the whole view. So when I see the Appalachian Valleys and everything, I'm really seeing the whole thing, you know, even though I know <clears throat> there's things I can't see. That's why I stop at the uh, next viewpoint, because, oh, well, then that gives me a different view. And then I go down the road and stop, well, let's stop there. Oh, that gives me a different view. But the assumption is that there is one whole existing reality that exists outside of me. So there's this belief that the reality I'm seeing exist independent of me. So if I died, it would still be there, just like it is right now, with the same meaning and everything, you see? So this, let's get the idea that the ego is a viewpoint, and you have to have a viewpoint uh, if, if you have a me, for, if, just walk around the room. I mean, I, I'm standing right here and I'm looking at this big living room. But if I was suddenly at the door over there, looking this way, I would see a different room. But the assumption is that it's all one room. You see? So if somebody else comes in, stands over here, or you walk over there, or if I just take one foot. I see, it, I see a little adjustment of the room. I see a little something a little different than I did before. Not much, but you see each... Yeah, because see, I can look in this uh, corner cabinet over there, and when I step here, the reflection of the light disappears, so that doesn't have a reflection in the light. So just, just, just one little inch changes reality. But there is the assumption that makes this work that there is a reality here that exists independent of my view. If I didn't have that assumption, I would be like in a uh, uh, psychosis where every move, oh, a different world, where am I now? Oh, 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 where am I now? Oh, oh, where am I now? You see, there's no, there's no consistent reality connecting all of my different views. So this ego view depends upon the belief that there is an independent reality out there upon which I, I can change my uh, selective little views. But I'm seeing this reality that is one that exists no matter what my view is. Now this reality is an assumption. You see. Um, So, that's necessary for me to maintain sanity. But the point is here that is that the ego is a viewpoint. So let's, um, and then Tolley talks about the collective viewpoint. Well, the best way to to get an understanding of this is, is by looking at what has happened to our culture today very rapidly. We're talking just a decade years, one year, it changes so rapidly through the advancing technology of our electronic digital media world, uh, which is now on a smartphone. This, this little smartphone, I don't have mine here, this little smartphone is a big screen TV. Turn it this way, big screen, well, it's small, but it's the same thing as a big screen TV. And this is the sacrament, this is the portal into a reality that we assume exists. 
in the same way that I assume that this reality of the room is uh, exists independent of me, and I'm and I just uh, and I'm not seeing separate worlds. So, so there's this media reality, this media world out there, is something entirely new. Uh, the world used the window to the world used to be newspapers, and you can see very dramatically the difference between looking at the world through a newspaper story and looking at the world through uh, CNN uh, with, with uh, uh, real-time cameras going on, you see. It's the difference between looking at the TV screen in a real-time situation where they're reporting something that's happening and having the breaking news copy go across the bottom. Try, you can't look at the, you can't read the copy and you can't look at the screen and be involved in the visual action simultaneously. They are two different ways of viewing the screen. One is looking at the cop, the language, and the other is looking at the visual. And you can't do both at the same time. In fact, it, to me, it, it's a little irritating when the copy goes across the bottom. You know, what is that? You know, and then I have to take myself, I have to de detach myself from the visual. In the same way, when we watch movies, we have a friend of ours who is hard of hearing. So we put subtitles on. And I find that um, breaking up my viewpoint because I, my eye is attracted to the subtitles and now I am reading the subtitles, but when the subtitles are there, there are not there. I'm more into the movie. Totally, you see. So those subtitles abstract one of my senses. It, 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 it creates a language of the sound instead of the sound, you see? This is something we can, you can observe. Uh, when the subtitles are going across, it's language. It's, it's the written, spoken word. And so the character is saying something, and it's written down there. And you can notice how it kind of like splits the involvement into the movie. The subtitles are there. All of your senses are in the movie. And you're not aware of uh, uh, language. But then the subtitles go across, and you can read what is being spoken, and which is really handy if it's a foreign language, but you can notice how it kind of like is when the storm comes across your TV screen and, and goes between the satellite and uh, uh, your TV receiver, and it starts to go, you see. Uh, it breaks it up a little bit, you know, so subtitles break it up. So the collective, uh, uh, the, the, the other way, uh, continuing this media metaphor or theater metaphor, is that a big thing now is uh, multiplex theaters. Now, I grew up in the 50s, and we would go downtown to the movie theater, and those movie theaters were like palaces. You had uh, velvet stairs, ushers in uniforms with a flashlight, uh, a selection of popcorn and everything. You had to get some of that. And, uh, and so you would go down and sit down, and it was a glorious thing. I, it was like Kennedy Center. You had opera boxes around, these big theaters in the cities. Uh, you'd see the balcony, two layers of balconies, opera boxes, theater had a stage. Uh, you had your best seats down here. You had the ushers, the Kennedy Center. And then there might be an organ player. They used to have uh, somebody playing the piano, the organ there before the movie started, or the piano, you know. And uh, maybe somebody would come up on stage and welcome you to the show. And then the lights would come down and the music would come up. And you would go into it on a trip, you see. And now there you have this uh, multiplex theater. So the theaters are now box-like, kind of like a capsule where you go to another planet and you just put your body in this capsule. So there's no experience of the theater itself. It just You just go in and sit down in this little box and uh, the lights go off. 
<laughs> you know, that's, you know, so let's get it over with. So anyway, but the point is that you have multiplex theaters, you know. And every, everywhere you go now on coming down the interstate and coming all these shopping centers and strip malls have big multiplex theater with all these different things. So the multiplex theater of the media today, if you look at our society as a theater, our living rooms are our theater. You're, we have nice recliner chairs and you go in the kitchen and get your popcorn, you see, and you got your, all your comforts here. So you don't want to have any desires to interrupt your movie experience, you see. So you go to the bathroom and you get your popcorn and snacks and you sit down, you see, and now you just park the body and the body goes away. So you're not really physically in action with the, with the media world and you uh, turn on the TV and there you go. But we select when the TV, when the screen comes on, unconsciously we select the theater we're going to sit in. So we might want, we might like to we sit in the conservative theater or we sit in the liberal theater. And the news comes on, you see. And uh, if we're sitting in the Black Lives Matter theater, well then when the um, issues of uh, police and, and uh, um, confrontations with the uh, people, uh, we're rooting for the, for the Black Lives Matter theater, you know. Or if it's uh, uh, the, we're in the Trump theater, uh, when something comes up, we're rooting for uh, the Trump view, you see, the viewpoint. The viewpoint that gives a positive meaning to Trump. Black Lives Matter, just for this example, then we're, we're, we're in the viewpoint that gives a positive meaning to the Black Lives Matter. If we're in the uh, police matter, we get, we're looking at the same event, but we're getting a different meaning from it. If we're in the conservative uh, theater, where the same event is going to have a conservative point of view, or if we have a liberal theater, we're in a liberal theater, uh, we get a liberal point of view. <clears throat> the, point, the point is <laughs> that the theater we choose to sit in determines the meaning of the movie. It's the same. It would be, and, and we see this with movies too. I mean, you watch a movie and you got a bunch of people sitting in there watching the same movie. And you go around, and what did that movie mean to you? And you might get uh, four or five different viewpoints. And it would be interesting because you could see each viewpoint saw a different uh, meaning to it, you see, none of which included all of the viewpoints at once. So it's kind of like a, uh, you can never see or get all of these viewpoints in one view. You see, every, all of our views are going to be selective views, like slices of pie. But the pie itself can never be seen, because we're always just seeing a viewpoint. You see, so even the Appalachian Mountains, if you had a billion overlooks, you could not see the totality of the Appalachian. There'd always be another how about however minuscule there would be another viewpoint, you see. So the idea we're looking at here is that the uh, multiplex theater is the infinity of viewpoints. But then these viewpoints are like Russian dolls, you see, nesting dolls. Because if you just had uh, uh, a billion viewpoints, it would be kind of like a collective psychosis. So the viewpoints get... Uh, uh, for simplification, collect in different theaters of viewpoints. So you have the collective or conservative viewpoint and the liberal viewpoint, and then those viewpoints will break down into smaller theaters. You get the idea? So these larger collectives then break down into smaller viewpoints uh, in the same theater. Now, all of this is unconscious. We're not conscious of picking the theater we're going to sit in. Um, sit in the Hillary Theater, or the Trump Theater, or the Sanders Theater, or the LGBT Theater, or, um, you know, all of these different um, alt-right theater, 
<laughs> you know, we sit in these things, and we have no the un, the 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 point of view that we choose is unconscious. So the ego is unconscious. The ego is the point of view from which we view reality as a meaningful whole. You see, reality has to be one whole or else we are cuckoo. <laughs> or in other words, that's what when we when we when our one whole when our one reality breaks up, you see, we call that psychosis. It's a very bad place to be. People like LSD because it would uh, uh, break up the point of view. And, and, and when you knew that you were on an LSD trip, you were okay. But if you forgot you were on an LSD trip, you would, you would be in a panic, you see. If somebody gave you an LSD pill, and I never took it, but certainly um, if you watch Mad Men, you get the idea. <laughs> but the idea is if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, somebody gave you the LSD and suddenly your reality started breaking up, you would really go into a panic, you see. And uh, uh, extreme terror of the, everything that starts dripping and crawling and breaking up, you know, like the digital TV screen. But you don't know there's a storm, you see. So this uh, view we have of reality is very fragile. This point of view. So it's always subject to attack. You're a pure point of view. You're sitting in the same movie, living, watching the same thing, and two people suddenly have an argument about the view they have of what they're both seeing. You see, and this happens all you know. Suddenly, so these views attack get feel very threatened if somebody doesn't agree, because we want to have as many people agree to our view as possible because that affirms our view and makes our egoic point of view seem more real, you see. You see, the point of view doesn't exist. Only thing exists is the is the real reality, but the viewpoint has extracted the eye that sees reality outside of it. So you can look at it and study it, talk about it. That's a sofa, that's a coffee table, you see. The only way I can tell you that's a coffee table is because I'm outside of it. But if the viewpoint collapsed, I would experience the coffee table as the coffee table. That's what LSD does, it collapses the viewpoint. And marijuana does that too, to a certain degree. So the viewpoint collapses, we see the world as the sofa. Poetry, mystical poetry is all full of this. Suddenly you're going along and you're looking at the birds or something, and the next thing you're flying as the birds. But at the same time you still know you're separate from the birds, so you're not really uh, gone away somewhere as the bird, you see. But there is a sense that as the viewpoint weakens, there is a feeling, sense of unity with reality so that you are as what you see while at the same time you are aware of what you see. So there is still this sanity, ground of sanity there, so you don't really think of sudden, oh my God, I'm a bird, you see, but there is a sense of unity with the birds with reality. But when the viewpoint is strong, the separation from me and the object I'm viewing is very solid and, and very uh, vulnerable. So we want to get as many people into our theater as possible. That's what proselytizing is all about. You see? So do you know Jesus, you see? Well, we want everybody to know Jesus, so we want to get as many people into our theater as possible and uh, get rid of that other theater <laughs> that's there, you see. So this uh, thing we're looking at here is that the media mind that we're living in today is a new mind. 
is a new reality and we're not really very conscious of it yet because it's been happening so rapidly and it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, in, it, you know, it's, it's exciting because, and I talked about this the other day, it reminds me of the Holy Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, after the Roman Empire dissolved, a point of view, the Roman point of view dissolved, the Holy Roman Catholic Church replaced it as a viewpoint that gave meaning to reality. And it was a one dome reality, you see. And it just kept expanding by incorporating all the different pagan religions of Europe. Didn't fight them and try to kill them, it just incorporated it. Come on in. And it's expanding, you know. So the Holy, the Catholic, Holy Roman Catholic Church, the Christian view of reality, overlaid over the pagan view. So this pagan view is still there with an overlay of the Christian view, you see. So this viewpoint came over, right? But it was still there, the pagan culture, the deep roots of European religion and culture. Now, the problem with saying pagan is that, oh, the pagan's bad, you see, but that, <laughs> it's not bad. It's, it's the original culture. It's the organic culture of a people. It's a holistic, it's, a, it's an organic, uh, uh, source culture of a people, so that's a lot better than saying pagan. Pagan is a, is a negative label, you see. So it's an organic culture, and the Christian culture uh, spread o overlaid over it, so they kind of like came together and tried to, but they were, uh, I don't know if I want to get into this, this seems to be another talk. So let's come back to the multiplex theater of points of view and we're all, no matter what theater we choose, we, the, 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 the whole thing works because there is a unquestioned assumption that the reality behind the point of view, that transcends the points of view, is the same. In the same way that when you look at an overlook on the Appalachian Mountains, there is the assumption that the totality of the, over, of the Appalachian Mountains mountains there exist independent of all these points of view. So the point of view, when it claims to be the one and only view, the one and only reality, when that point of view believes that it is fixed and that its view is the certain view, then we get into uh, conflict and violence of the different points of view fighting each other to be the one view. And that's kind of like what's happened to our culture today, our society today, where the, the media has fragmented a reality that is given to us by the media. If the, if the power goes off, the the media world goes away. We all have a panic. I can't get on the internet. The TV's dead. What am I going to do? <laughs> you see? The, the, it's broken up, you see. We're disconnected. We've been unplugged. All I got to do now is sit in my living room. What am I going to do? <laughs> read? Oh, I can read. Look at the newspaper? Oh. <laughs> you see? We've become addicted to an electronic world that delivers reality in different views that we believe are the whole reality. So if we're sitting in a Trump theater, we believe the reality we're looking at is the true reality. And that liberal theater is fake theater. This is real time stuff, that's fake. I don't know who those people are, but they gotta get out, you see. So there is this uh, misunderstanding and unconsciousness about the reality that we're now living in, and it's increasing. I mean, images, media images, are getting bigger. 
you go into a home now. I mean, I've got a 67, 68, 65-inch TV screen here that my uncle bought. We went down in front. Our, the host we were staying with in uh, uh, Washington had a he had a 70-inch TV, 75-inch. You know, so yeah, I, I can see in the forbeable where the whole wall will be a TV screen, and you can see it coming where media is going to be. Uh, more and more we're going to have uh, glasses or something to make it 3D or the TV set's going to be 3D and you can see in the future where it will be uh, hologram TV where you're going to be watching the media as if you're inside of it and you can turn it around and look at different viewpoints of the media while you're in the media I mean they have that now you put on the headsets and you enter into a virtual reality so you get the idea here that the real reality is the living room you're sitting in that is, you can hear it, you can touch it, you can, mm, good coffee, you can taste it. See, this is, this, this is the ground, but now it's upon this ground that this multiplex media electronic based uh, reality uh, is attracting us so we're leaving our bodies parked on the sofa and we enter into this reality world and we are pulled and played like puppets oh my god that's terrible oh and there's nothing terrible about that you know they the other side did it too you know and so on but this the the uh when you go in a movie you are going to have emotional experiences that's why we go but we suspend disbelief. We know it's a movie. So we can be scared to death, and it's okay. Ha, ha, ha. It was really great. I was scared. That got me, you see. Or I cried in that, oh, my God, boo-hoo, you see. That's great because we suspend disbelief. But when we watch the TV and media news, which is now 24-7, we don't suspend disbelief. We believe it's real. But the media is an external metaphor or replication of our own mind. So in this room now, I'm looking at that lamp as if my awareness is a camera. And I can focus in. I can go, oh, I can look at the square on that lamp. And if I got closer, I could look at the grain in the wood on that square. I could keep zooming in. Or I could zoom back out and see, oh, okay, I see the, that lamp and I see the sofa. I see the whole wall. I see this half the room, you see. I can't see that side. So I only see half the moon. Somebody could be standing behind me. I wouldn't see it, you see. You only see half the moon. But the point is, I choose what to look at. No, now I'm looking at that lamp. And now I'm looking at you. But I don't see you. I just know you're there. But I'm looking at the back of this iPad. Now I'm looking at my hand. Now I'm looking at that hand. Okay. So each thing I look at is a reality. Because everything else is blurred. See, when I look at this close up here, my hand. Oh, I can see the, uh, the, the, the lines in my hand and my... My, my ring and all that, and I can say my, that fingernail needs a little clipping. While I'm doing that, this rest of the room is blurred. Now, whoop, wide angle, oh, now it's back in focus, and guess what? This is blurred. It's like a camera. So the media is like that. The media, who is it that selects to look at that guy or that guy or this wreck and not that wreck? So the media is selecting dots to photo to film and as you notice that when you look at something it changes it and this is what quantum physics is all about I think I've been talking too long here <laughs> so anyway the idea that we're working with today is that the mind and media are now one but we're unconscious of it and we select the theaters of reality in which to sit and get meaning of the world from our theatrical or theater point of view. So 
dissolving my personal ego and the collective ego is becoming conscious and aware that it's just a point of view. It's not real. It's just a point of view, you see. And it's kind of like awakening. It's kind of like when the storm of discernment comes between the satellite and the receiver and begins to break up and make you question what you're looking at. Oh, it's just a screen. So when discernment comes into your life, which is the awakening of the uh, uh, clear mind, the awakening of uh, uh, wisdom, uh, the awakening of discernment, you begin to realize that what you're fixating on is just a point of view that has no substantial reality in itself. It's not the only reality. There is a transcendent reality out there which you can't see unless you break up your point of view that you fix on, you see. So it's that not reacting, as Tolley said, it's when you, when you realize you are reacting to the TV as if it were real, your blood pressure going up, your anxiety skyrocketing, your depression, uh, your uh, angst, your feeling of the end of time is coming. Oh my God, oh my God, this is terrible, 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 you see. What's the world coming to? All of that is like watching a... Uh, uh, catastrophe movie. <laughs> the emotions are the same if you're watching the Titanic sink or if you're watching the news. But one of them we know is a movie and the other one we think is real. But there isn't really much difference. So let's end with that. Thank you for dropping in. I'll see you this evening.